really want to value um, our judging versus your judging. So we are, we will actually look at these and analyze it at the last, at the, at the end of the meeting. So it's very important for you to kind of participate in this process. Again, um, I am Frank Namirat, CEO of Intelligent Medical Objects. Um, as part of the, the, the so-called, uh, the private sector uh, companies who are involved in AMIA, we decided to do this concept called sh Shark Tank. So it's not that easy, let me tell you. I mean, <laughs> there are a lot of legal stuff goes on around when you start having IP presented in the, in the environment that we are presenting. So we were very fortunate that we connected with a MedStar, MedStarter, which is really a company who does this crowdsourcing model. And I think, you know, we're very, very fortunate. But more important for, for what has happened is, is really the panel. I think we have an amazing panel here, and I want to make sure, kind of introduce them to you too, so you know who they are and why they were selected. Barbara Rapchak has been instrumental in the back um, to actually help make this project come together, one of the fastest ever MedStarter project. Uh, Barbara has already had 13 different SBIR grant, has never submitted a grant that it was never approved. And, and most of her grants have actually been gone to multiple phases. She does reviews for NIH, as well as the most important part is, is that she's been a private company, and as a private company has done this. So I think it, she, ha she brings a lot of intelligent background, some experience. Um, Dan Watanapan is um, uh, our CFO, but more importantly, he has been involved in the Fortune 500 across the nations. He has done many uh, M&As in the, in the market, is part of the team from the a War Warburg Pincus, a private equity funds who actually is advising and, and leading as one of our leadership in our company. And we are very fortunate to have him. He was most likely going to ask you guys about the numbers, so you better be ready, you know. So <laughs> he, he knows numbers, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Charles Saffron, actually, um, really, uh, my mentor in this transition from private, uh, from pro, uh, so-called academic section to the private sector. Charlie has a significant number of innovators who go through his program at Harvard, and, and I think by far there, I would say, there's some who's who's of, uh, so-called entrepreneurial and, and successful uh, academician in informatics who, who have been uh, his fellows um, throughout the year. It is a great honor to have Charlie on, on, on the seat because he can provide, try to make sure the work that you're doing, what the relevant of that work is to the informatics because we want to make sure to use this program to accelerate the movement between the private sectors and academic sector focusing on informatics. So just want to make sure you're aware of that. And then we have Michael Kaufman. Michael is, is um, uh, by far, I would say, the, the ultimate angel investor. I mean, he has investment in multiple uh, VCs in the countries, but he's well known for HIT, you know, health information technology. He has probably more people in his LinkedIn than ever you could possibly <laughs> think of who have all the contacts. Uh, we were looking for some executive at my company, and. I'm not kidding you. All these who's who that we were brought to us, they're all linked in with Michael, so he knows them all. <laughs> and I'll be, with, with the further ado, I'm going to um, introduce Alex Sphere, who is really <coughs> going to be running the show. Alex? Thank you, Frank. Thank you for supporting this contest, and thank you, judges, and thank you. Uh, all of you are very important to all of this. So I run MedStarter.com. And we, uh, we help new ideas get from idea out to market. And we know it's not that easy. I mean, how many of us were scientists or academicians, IT leaders, doctors? We went to grad school. We went to, to med school. We didn't go to design school, business school, work on Madison Avenue. So we help you make that transition from great idea out to market. So when uh, IMO and AMIA and LOF came to us and said, hey, we want to do a contest for informatics innovation. So that'd, that'd be fantastic. And we really rapidly, thanks to Barbara, actually, and Frank, uh, uh, just really uh, got this up going really quickly. We got 100, over 100 teams uh, applied. And you know, I was at 28 went live on the platform. We make a very difficult application. And it, but the, the application actually helps you package your idea and get it out to market. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, over a thousand uh, times people clicked or looked at things and things like this. Uh, about 20,000 people came to the website. And the five teams in front of you today are five pretty amazing teams, and we really love to hear what you guys think about it. I don't know if you guys looked at your programs. Everybody get a program? If you didn't get a program, uh, Avishah in the back or Bizad will uh, come grab, bring you one. So just raise your hand. And what we really want is we want to hear what you think, okay, about these teams. If you want to work with these guys, if you like what they're doing, if you want to hear from them, maybe you want to mentor them. Because honestly, it takes a village to, to get uh, a startup out of the lab or out of uh, you know, the, your idea, your head, and out into the market. So they need help. So you guys being here, it's actually a very important uh, part of the process. So we'll make sure you guys get connected if you turn these in. You can always just take a picture of it and email it to us if you want, if you want to keep this and you want to have a picture of all of us or what have you. Um, and uh, so that's kind of how this contest works. It's crowd judged. So we look at your information. We look at the, the expert judges. Uh, we look at what happened online during their projects on the site. Uh, and we really want to know what all of you guys have to say. We also want to know, this is the first AMIA Pitch IT competition, so we really want to know what you think about that, too. So you see there's a place for additional comments. If you could tell us about that, Frank and Barbara and the team really want to hear about what you guys have to say, if we can do better, if we can do worse. Uh, lastly, uh, out in the back is Ivan Schachler and uh, from West Communications. They are live streaming this, okay? So what you're saying in this room does not stay in this room. We also have guys like Colin Hung here. Where's Colin? Raise your hand. Uh, leader of H H uh, healthcare leader, HCLDR tweet chat. So a lot of this is happening on Twitter. We'd like to hear what you guys think about the teams on Twitter, okay? And we're gonna use that as part of the voting, okay? So the more noise you make out there online, okay, the more we're gonna know about it, the more you engage with the idea, and the more the world hears about it. Uh, the last one of these we ran trended to number five on Twitter. Uh, which means that we're like competing with the Donald Trumps and the Kim Kardashians of the world. <laughs> Believe it or not, right? <laughs> Health tech gets up there. Okay, not that often, but sometimes. Anyway, so yes, yeah, so that's the back of this. And okay, so they're all gonna get five minutes to pitch and we're gonna be kind of hard about that. They only get five minutes, it is a contest. And at the end of the day, they, the winner gets that big fig check you see over there behind the, uh, but they actually get real money too. Uh, so <laughs> it's good to have both. Uh, but also an important thing is getting the awareness, the traction, pilots, partners, customers, mentors, people who are gonna work with these companies. So that's what it's really all about, is, is helping these companies get going. So without further ado, they get five minutes, they get Q&A, people who have questions, if you line up with this mic, if there's time, we'll take questions from the crowd, because the crowd is very important, everything we do here. Yes? I'm interested to talk about the health uh, organization that you just said this. Uh, oh yeah, so this is, uh, our 17th contest we've run. We started out doing it for GE, for the NIH. Uh, we've done them for the American Heart Association, the American Medical Association, Takeda Pharmaceuticals. We did them for our own venture fund now because when a company wins one of these contests, within months they are off to the races. Um, so the last winner of the AMA contest we ran uh, didn't had one pilot at one hospital, and now they're in 30 hospitals. 16 months later, 30 hospitals. So getting across that Rubicon, and they're a four-year-old company that had one pilot. So getting across the Rubicon from great idea out into the market, that's what this is all about. And I know it just seems like a couple of people in a room on a given day, but you know, thanks to Ivan and the West Communications team, this will get out to hundreds of thousands of people, and, uh, and it will help all the teams, not just the winners. So okay, so without further ado, um, so our first team, as you can see on the screen, is, is uh, P Health now. And so he's going to get five minutes. So Jeremy and Tim, Tim Ulish and Jeremy Harper. Uh, so come on up. Uh, you get one mic. You guys can share it. Start now. All right, we're P Health now. I'm Jeremy Harper, and uh, we're excited to be here today. So our mission is patient empowerment via voice. We may not have droids. Uh, but we do have smart home technology, and smart home technology is not being applied in the healthcare domain today. Uh, you've all heard of Google Home and Amazon Alexa. What we're going to do is those devices can't be HIPAA compliant. Uh, they're designed for consumers. We're going to take a couple of open source software systems, Jasper, Mycroft.ai, and apply that, create a HIPAA wrapper around it, and deliver it to the healthcare domain. Our target audience is hospitals, nursing facilities, assisted living. So put yourself as a patient. If you're sitting in a patient room in the bed and you aren't as mobile, uh, just being able to say, turn on and off the lights, turn on and off the TV, turn on and off the fan, maybe I want a breeze, maybe it's too hot in the room. 
um, being able to say what's on the lunch menu today and actually place an order are all things that we have the technology to put in place today and no one's doing it. Uh, our model is going to be software as a service. The software itself is free. We're using an open source software. It's already built, it's already tested, it's already proven. We're just creating a HIPAA uh, compliant wrapper around it. Uh, again, with compliant wrapper, there are going to be specific skills that we as a co company are going to release that will uh, make this more usable and friendly within the healthcare domain, such as menu ordering, uh, allowing patients to generate their own memos, tying into the HL7 feed so we know when someone's discharged and can reset the device. And with that, there are just a few barriers that we see. Um, the general security, so being able to use these open source platforms means that we can put it within the uh, actual server infrastructure within these uh, systems so that it's not an always on device going out to Amazon, Google Home, or any of those. Uh, we can be HIPAA compliant. And then finally, uh, our vision is eventually secure devices. So we'll be tr testing and piloting with uh, Raspberry Pi 3s. They already work on these open source platforms. Uh, and our vision is to partner with a company that we can install speaker systems within the ceiling so these devices don't walk. Uh, a lot of us in the healthcare industry who have uh, worked with tablets have seen that tablets do walk when they're with patients. And so uh, that's our vision. And Tim's gonna talk about our market opportunities. Our competitive advantage is that we wanna be the first to market. So since what we're doing is repackaging what's already out there, we wanna push that out as fast as we can. So we've decided to go with a contract model. Uh, the idea is, is if you have a smaller institution assisted living uh, organization that's 40 beds or less, we would go for 30,000 a year, and then we would do 50,000 a year for a larger facility, and then a customized contracts for an academic medical center. Since this, uh, or a multi-site facility potentially. So, in the, in where we can, if we want to teach uh, the device a new skill set, depending on where it is, so that's where the the contract can adjust for that for additional skills. The first year, we plan just to get the device out there to get the skill set out there, um, and then we want to see, we expect to see profits by year two and year three, and have it grow exponentially. This it leads back into why we're going to the contract instead of doing it by device. Our expectation is that we can uh, build the HIPAA Reliant wrapper in three months, pilot it for six months, and then we can actually go out and do sales. So that first year is doing a lot of infrastructure build. Our cost will be relatively low since all of this is already, since the majority of everything has already been created. We plan on having a staff around 400,000. We're going to be using Amazon services to start up for about 30 grand. And for uh, repackaging the device, we have it for 20 grand per device. But again, we want to go not for the contract, no, no. Nah. For the hundred devices. For the hundred devices, but the idea is to go with the contract. And you're on your slippers. Um, so we are going to be partnering with assisted, uh, with assisted living, <laughs> nursing, nursing homes, homes uh, small community hospitals to really get our name out there. And what we're asking for is uh, a million to get started and to get. A uh, two-year runway so that we're out there and uh, we are actually making a profit at the end of year two. And if we get more funding, it just means that we can push this out faster to larger uh, facilities. So with that, that's our pitch. And thank you so much for voting for us. I'm Jeremy Harper. I have a decade in health IT. Tim has a decade in health IT. I have a master's in biomedical informatics. Tim has a master's in business administration. And we both currently work for Ohio State Medical Center. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have uh, seven minutes for question and answer, uh, so I'll let you guys take it away. Uh, and if you have questions, once again, line up at the mic, um, and always speak into the mic so that the <coughs> internet can hear you. Oh, that's it. So I really appreciate the presentation, guys. That was, that was a nice pitch and, and delivering the key points. A couple things that go in my mind. One is, who's the decision maker who's gonna say, yes, I want this in my facility? And with that, how do you demonstrate value with some hard metrics or facts that get them compelled to this in place? Sure. So uh, different types of facilities have different decision makers. Uh, you know, I, I view personally that all hospitals are measured on their patient satisfaction. And I think that this is something that after we take it into a pilot, uh, we'll see improved patient satisfaction scores for the health system. 
And so I think that's going to be our driving factor for some health systems. I think at others, it's just going to be, um, what's amazing to me is how much the nursing community has just come to us and said, this would be amazing because the nursing uh, community gets the call button hit and they're the ones who have to go help the patient for things that we can already automate in our own homes. So there's no one currently doing this. Um, we're just repackaging existing technology. And so uh, we're going to be, have to be the first to market and we're going to have to penetrate quickly. Uh, there's not necessarily any large barrier uh, to competitors coming out. Um, we do, I, I've approached both Amazon and Google to work with us for my health system because uh, this was where my idea originally came from. And both of them told me that they're focused on consumers right now rather than the business angle. Um, so, you know, Google and Amazon, if they want to go into the domain, they can take over the world in five minutes. <laughs> but uh, we're not building towards those as our competitors. Uh, have you uh, thought about the challenges that you're going to have with uh, sort of people talking in a, <laughs> in a impaired state? As sure. You, uh, you know, so it's absolutely not going to work for every use case and it's not going to work for every patient. The great thing about uh, the Mycroft.ai, which is what we've been piloting on our own home servers, uh, is that it can handle multiple languages. But if they're impaired, the likelihood is high. We're not going to be able to translate uh, exactly what they're saying. Well, so so the, other, the other piece is, have you looked at um, what some of the things, are they doing it via text or via uh, pad. There's a company called Get Well Network, for mm -hmm. example, that does a, has a big patient interaction. Have you, have you looked at that and potentially partnering with some of those guys for voice enabling now? Uh, we haven't looked at partnering with them. I, I did look at them when I was doing the market analysis to see if this is an idea that's already out there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my whole reason behind this is patient empowerment, and I really think that this can go out and change the world. And my excitement is let's go out there and actually make the world a better place. What's the downstream cost of smart switches in a nursing home, uh, speakers in the ceiling, sure. and integration with their dietary system to order stuff? Sure. Seats? So uh, it's going to depend on the facility, and it's going to depend on how automated they are today. Uh, so if you've already got a system where, patient, er, where the nurses are going back to their unit and they're entering in the dietary order, um, that's an electronic system and we'll be able to leverage that and tie into it with uh, just a regular interface stream. And I'm sorry, you had another part? Well, you need smart switches and speakers in the ceiling. To, uh, so uh, it's to going to work off of Wi-Fi, just like uh, Google Home Echo Dot or uh, one of those devices. And so when I'm saying it's embedded in the ceiling, those companies have managed to get their devices to a form factor like this. Um, I'm thinking even if we get to a form factor of this size, that's this typical speaker size within the hospital room. Um, so, so in your price point of thirty to 50000 per site, yeah. is that including the hardware, the equipment, the install required to do that, or would that be on top of that? That would be on top of that. That's just the service contract. And have you estimated what that would cost for the average nursing facility? So Tim's been running those numbers. I, I will tell you that for the pilot, we estimated $150 per device because we're just going to use Raspberry Pis and peripherals to plug into it uh, so that we can get it out there faster. And w while we're piloting, we're able to go work with manufacturers. And my anticipation is we'll get it in the $150 to $200 price range. Um, so there are a number of different metrics that we don't know which one's going to uh, be most useful. I, I think that if we're going into a facility that has low patient satisfaction scores, I'm really interested in seeing does this impact my satisfaction as a patient. Uh, if we're going to into a facility that has high patient satisfaction scores, we're not going to be able to tell any meaningful difference there. Um, one of the metrics I'm interested in is time, is how much time does this save? How much time does this uh, free up for healthcare providers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Susan Hull, Wellspring Consulting, formerly Chief Nurse Informatics Officer at Cincinnati Children's. This is very exciting. There's been lots of conversation in our communities of practice of what this could save for nursing and for patients. So 
a comment. I think your, your, your plan to go forward is too modest. Um, I think this is really significant if you can figure out the HIPAA wrapper quickly and get it. My question would be, have you thought of allowing the patient or the family to bring in their home devices so that you can say, you know, Alexa, when did I take my last yellow pill? Absolutely. And so that there's a continuity, particularly in this nursing home market or this, you know, support sure. that patients could have at home and in the home. I, I brought my Echo Dot into my office, and I'll tell you, it's not designed for business units. It's not designed for multiple sites. You can't even tell it uh, this uh, device is located at this location. Uh, they can do that for most of our healthcare systems. Most of us have open Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is going to be a more business-oriented device that will stay with a single room uh, at all times. For okay, people. room located. Thank you. Yeah. One more. We have time for one more. Hi, I'm Sean. I'm one of the physicians at Geisner Health System. I have a smart home, and it's very expensive. Each light bulb costs about thirty to sixty dollars. The thermostat itself is about two to three hundred dollars. You're talking per room. Um, and also each of these things need a Wi-Fi signal. So now if you have a hospital with 100 beds and you have you know, four lights, a thermostat, you're adding multitudes of Wi-Fi signals, so you need a much more robust networking system. On top of the costs, I worry about um, voice recognition. This, that's not free software. You're using right now Alexa, but that's an Amazon proprietary voice recognition that uses web-based computing to calculate someone's voice and multi you use a storage, there's a privacy sure. issue because it has to, so a lot so of cost issues. So it's an open issues. source software, completely free to anyone to use it, mycroft.ai.com, okay. or not .com, it's just a website, mycroft.ai. Does it gather data? I, uh, is located locally and you can choose whether you send out data or it's just local. Okay, and, all right. And you can keep that privacy in house. All right. And I'm sorry we're done with our questions. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much. Okay, so thank you, that was, uh, that was great. Uh, while Avi Shah loads up our next uh, contestant. Um, uh, so take a little time to think about if you do want to work with those companies, take time to tweet with the AMIA 2017 hashtag. Um, and uh, thanks for those great questions from the crowd, they were fantastic. So coming up now is a, is a company that actually just changes the name, this happens a lot actually, um, and they will probably change it again, I will tell you. So, but, uh, so now they're called StoryCare Health. Uh, they were Bit News Health if you had gone to the website. And um, my notes that have everybody's name on it is gone. So uh, I don't remember everybody's name. So come on up here, uh, StoryCare Health. And, uh, oh, thank you. Roy Cohen <laughs> and Keon. Uh, so so uh, you guys get five minutes like everybody else. And good luck. Do the best. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. We're StoryCare Health, and we uh, take hospital discharge instructions and turn them into visual stories. Uh, the problem of hospital readmissions cost the healthcare system $40 billion a year. This is more than just money, right? If you're a patient and you have to go back to the hospital within 30 days of your release, it's a huge inconveni inconvenience for you and your family. One of the factors is simply discharge instructions look like this. This is a huge blob of text that is supposed to uh, instruct health uh, people with, um, who are discharged with uh, heart condition uh, from one of the nation's top 10 national hospitals. This is not only just an overwhelming piece of text, it's also filled with medical terms that a patient, I can understand some of them. So let alone a patient who doesn't have a master's degree right now. Um, yeah, a lot, this isn't just intuitive, also it's scientific. A lot of nurses, 84% of the nurses around the country say that their patients don't understand discharge instructions. So we, there, there has been a test that shows, a, a study that showed that patients respond really well to visual stimuli um, accompanied by short bits of text, um, and this has been one of the inspirations after which we built our own product. And this is what StoryCare looks like right now. So it's, uh, it's like Instagram. Think about Instagram. It's an image with a text portion, a short, easy to read bit of text. And you're supposed to be, uh, you, you can slide through it easily like you would on Instagram. Um, the way we do it, we take, so we actually are here to serve the existing system. So we take what uh, discharge instructions the uh, clinic spits out, right? That blob of text. 
uh, we use our own product to summarize the text into those short sentences that you saw and to match them with visuals. So this is another example of what our product could look like instead of stock photos, which you'd seen before, we could use illustrations and that's our future. Um, and then to deliver it to the patient, whether it's to their mobile device or if they're not that tech savvy, you can print it out along with the discharge instructions that you uh, produce right now. And yeah, we're relying on text summary APIs. Some of them are open source, some of them are our own NLP uh, code that uh, we uh, wrote, and image matching APIs. Um, again, it's a combination of open source and proprietary. So we actually conducted a pilot study with non-healthcare users, and we, in testing this, we tested upon three dimensions. This was whether or not they were able to understand the material, how engaged they felt like our instructions were, and whether or not they were likely to adhere. And we found our p-value was statistically significant at 0.02. We've also validated this with a number of clinicians. Uh, so we spoke with uh, D Dr. Monica Safford, uh, and, and I'll actually be explaining one of the potential collabor collaborations that we're looking at right now. Um, but unanimously, all of our, uh, the physicians that we spoke with in leadership positions were highly optimistic. Uh, we are currently in talks with Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center about incorporating into uh, an existing cancer study. And what's really exciting about that is we actually don't have to go through the, the laborious IRB process. Uh, they're excited to, to work and, and start uh, collecting data for us uh, using StoryCare immediately. Uh, we're also looking at integrations with, as I mentioned, with Monica Staff Safford at um, Weill Cornell Medicine into something they have called PALS, which is a patient education tool that they're currently using. Um, in terms of monetization, we're looking at uh, cost savings for hospitals. That's, uh, in speaking with clinicians, that's where they felt like this was uh, the, the greatest opportunity for a business model and also EMR integration. For product priorities, we are looking at expanding the training data that we currently have. Uh, we also have uh, worked with designers in revamping how our product is perceived by users. And also, uh, we're, even though we have the machine learning algorithm, we're looking at how we could continually improve that, uh, the images that are produced. In terms of collaborations, why we're here, we're looking at ways that we can partner with all of you and uh, pi various pilot opportunities. As I mentioned, we're working with a number of hospitals in New York City, but we're constantly uh, looking at uh, so why we came together, Roy and I were both Masters of Computer Science, uh, Connective Media and Health Tech students at Cornell Tech. And we're, uh, Roy has spent many years in documentary filmmaking uh, and also is a product manager and I uh, have been a healthcare consultant for payers and providers and also a technologist. Um, so please vote for StoryCare Health. We're excited to be here and happy to answer any questions after. Thanks. Well, I think our emphasis really is on user experience. And I don't want to name names, but you just named one. And I think one of the problems that we're seeing in this space is the the initial, you know, part of like the blob of text that is being spitted out, and patients just kind of have to deal with it. That user experience, how patients like creating something that works for patients. <clears throat> no one's really tackling that well. There's a company called Telesophia that's creating videos. Also, Pals for Health is also creating videos, but we're in talks with Pals for Health. Videos are really expensive to produce. Um, when it comes to text or incorporating text and images, um, right now there's no one that's really doing that bit well, unless I'm gonna learn something today uh, that I don't know, but that emphasis on patient experience and how can we really educate patient on their level, whether it's literacy or accessibility, um, is, is something that we bring to the table that's new. Suppose there's a thousand um, release instructions that sure. need to exist. Yep. How much of that thousand do you currently have lined up that it's ready to go? So, uh, so the al algorithm that we've put together, it uses NLP technology, so we're essentially summarizing the, the text that already exists. 
Um, the way in, in talks with designers, what we're working on is um, essentially we'll have a database um, and using the summarization algorithm, it'll, it'll put together uh, aspects that essentially create a, a holistic story. Um, so it's, yeah. yeah. I think, I mean, I think you're asking me how many have we produced how and how many. How many have you produced and how much yeah. more do you have to go? Right now, we've produced, that evolution? Right now we've produced dozens, right? No more than that because we're working with stuff that we can find online because I don't have an IRB to, taste this with, to <laughs> test us with patients. However, yeah. now, with hopefully, you know, Pals for Health or other factors at Wild Cornell, we <coughs> could jump into current studies and then start working with real discharge instructions. So far, we've been training it on not real. So, um, yeah, we have like. So the question is, how do you scale that with the right kind of partnerships? Or so uh, the first one we're looking at is uh, <laughs> Heather Yao. She's a colon uh, cancer surgeon, very, very much into M health. Um, and so she's actually offered us to be able to test with her patients. Also with Andrew Pusik at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Yeah. Uh, so we're actually looking at doing it for very specialized conditions first. Um, and then from that, broadening our scope to, to various, to, to essentially everything. So we're, we're, we're working on a very targeted approach first. And, and what's the business model? How do you expect to sell this? That's the first question. The second question is, have you, have you, so you haven't talked to Access Care, which is a really big gorilla in this uh, space, but, uh, um, you know, any, any plans to talk to any people about, you know, sort of working with them, seeing, re really understanding what they're doing? I assume they're, moving towards, I mean, they've always been just pure tech, so I right. assume they're moving towards this kind of thing. Absolutely. Um, those are, both, both of those questions are questions where we are now <laughs> starting to have to do all this work. We're talking to Peter Steele at Wild Cornell, who's uh, leading their patient education um, venture, um, and Exit Care is one of the companies that we're hoping to talk to uh, soon. To be honest with you, I still don't have a full grasp of the value that I'm offering to all these people. I know that every single person professional I talked to told me that they needed it, and that those were especially clinicians. Um, to have a business model to me implies that I've done really thorough market research and I know how much I can charge for it. And right now, I don't know what would make the most sense to charge for it because I don't understand how much people would want to pay for it yet. But, but really the benefit is the cost savings. Quality improvement yep. was something that constantly came up with physicians. Um, and also with these partnerships, many of these these large hospitals have expressed interest. Um. Hi, I'm Eric Pan from Westad, and my question is about in your process of translating and how you position your product. Have you thought about your sort of liability if you're simply supplementing the instruction or replacing the instruction? The accurate translation is a major issue, and closely relating is cultural sensitivity. sensitivity. For example, some common gestures such as simply pointing a finger is very derogatory in some cultures. So how do you ensure your images is appropriate across the spectrum of patients? Those are two wonderful questions that I love to answer. So the first one is, yeah, we're talking to legal experts. We're based at Cornell Tech, which has that variety of experts that we can t consult with. Um, and we're trying to figure out exactly that legal aspect. We're definitely looking not to um, kind of replace anything, but to complement and legal is one of it. And in terms of cultural, yeah, that's something that, I mean, I'm Israeli, Kian's family is from Iran, we're very aware of it, um, and we're, and it's in the back of our minds. And, you know, coming from where we come from, a lot of it is user testing and testing the product with different populations and seeing how it works for different populations across gender, or across sexual preference and culture. And, yeah, we're definitely, that is always in the back of our minds as we're testing. Thank you. And, Hey, great job, guys. Uh, so I noticed you're both MS and informatics. I, you know, I always like to see uh, three four-legged stools. Uh, I get worried when all the legs are on one side, though. So what are your roles in the company? And tell me about your team. Yeah, so I come from actually documentary filmmaking. So in a lot of ways, I'm also like the how do we make visual things work side. Um, and we're, you know, slightly more uh, technical. Kian, you yeah, want so to I, I have a background in healthcare, um, been in consulting. Uh, so I've been really been on the clinical side, working with the physicians and uh, validating our product with patients, with providers. One last question. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm, I may have missed this, but a yeah, billion dollars, a lot of money. How do you know how much of this is just understanding instructions? I'm a clinician. A lot of our patients bounce to the ED because they can't afford the meds. 
Uh, they're in uh, food deserts. They just can't af do what we're asking them to do. Yeah. Um, yes, by no means did we mean to imply that we're trying to tap into like 40, yeah, I mean, we're, there's a big problem of hospital readmissions and this is one strategy to help address that problem. Uh, I think patient education is a place that needs a lot of innovation. It's a field that needs a lot of innovation. Our product is fully automated and is there to try to help bring like good, high quality, easy to read uh, material to those patients and that's what we're hoping to do. Thanks. Great job, fellas. Uh, really, really great to see what you guys are doing. Also out of New York. Woo. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so next up is going to be uh, our favorite name, Fire Hydrant. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love a good pun. Uh, Matthias Hockman uh, is going to come up and talk to you about that once we get his uh, deck up and loaded. Are the timers ready? Are the judges ready? <laughs> I just spent a weekend at a marching band competition. That's what they always say at the beginning of everything. Come on up, guys. Oh, we have, oh, we have a question for Dan. I'm yeah. sorry, Dan. And Dan Seeds, too. Okay. Welcome. My name is uh, Dr. Matthias Kochmann. And my name is Dr. Dan Seitz. Uh, I'm an emergency medicine physician, and Matthias and I are clinical informatics fellows at the Regan Street Institute in Indianapolis, Indiana. Together with our two other partners, the Indiana <laughs> Health Information Exchange, and the Indiana University Health System we're presenting you today, Fire Hydrant. Fire Hydrant is an innovative new technology that solves a key problem within healthcare. How to efficiently review patient information in their electronic charts and in the health information exchange. Dan will take you through his workflow in the ED when seeing a patient with chest pain. So when I'm in the emergency department and a patient comes in with chest pain, oftentimes the first thing that I'll get is an EKG from the nurse. An EKG in and of itself can be useful at, at times, but more often than not, the utility lies in comparing that EKG in my hand with one in the computer system. So early on in this process, I'll jump into the medical record, in our case, Cerner at IU Health, and I'll try to find an old EKG. So I may be able to dig up an EKG. There's a couple other things that are really useful for patients with chest pain. A cath report, <laughs> if at all possible, is sort of the gold standard of what does this patient's coronary arteries look like and have they had any previous interventions done. An echocardiogram or stress echocardiogram can often uh, show the, the structure and function of the heart at rest or potentially um, with some exertion. And then a cardiology note is always useful if a patient has an existing cardiologist. Finally, a hospital discharge summary gives me really a bird's eye view of a patient because it lists off all their prior diagnoses and medications, and can often be a, a good indicator of a patient's overall health. So in Indiana, we have the largest health information exchanges, or one of them in the, in the country, and I can go and access information from other sites. And oftentimes this requires jumping out of the EMR and going into a separate interface to try to find other information from around the state, information that may or may not even be there. This outside of my workflow process can take up to two to three minutes waiting for data to load, sifting through data, and that's a pretty time-consuming uh, process. So because of those time limitations in the emergency department, you know, I've got patients rolling in the door who are critical, and I may have to task switch left and right. I often don't have that two or three minutes to go through that outside data. And, and this may result in me ordering duplicitous tests, potentially even admitting a patient unnecessarily, if the data is out there that could, could allow me to safely discharge the patient. And ultimately, it cuts into the efficiency of my care. Um, the emergency department handles 82% of unscheduled inpatient admissions. So that's a garden hose into the hospital. And if we could take this system and expand it beyond chest pain, as is our plan, to other common emergency department complaints, we're talking about potentially having a big data impact on inpatient hospital admissions and hospital costs. Fire hydrant makes big data actionable at the point of care. Using fast healthcare interoperability standards, we save the physician time by bringing the valuable information right into his workflow. The app lives right in the EHR of the physician and can be easily invoked from the left side banner. It then automatically searches the health information exchange 
for the five most valuable items that the physician needs to know about chest pain. And then Dan, with just one click, can see the outside task that was done for his patient. Our architecture takes the proverbial <laughs> fire hose that the physician has to drink from these days and turns it into an easiest possible data stream for the end user to process. We're looking for partners in healthcare that have big data resources and have marketing and business knowledge to grow our platform further. Please vote for us to make the dream of interoperability true. Okay, great job guys. And uh, since you have a little extra time, you can use it now and I won't get out of your way. Questions? So, uh, <coughs> great name and really important idea. Uh, and and it first, does it have application uh, beyond the emergency room? And we all heard a, or many of us heard a wonderful keynote address by a patient who had been at uh, 16 hospitals in seven states or something like that. How does this work uh, across regions? And uh, so you're lucky in Indianapolis to be sort of home of the HIE. What happens when you go to other states or other regions that you need to connect with? So very, very good question. Um, so there is an independent consortium of health information exchange in, in the United States that we can connect to. But our business model also thinks about <coughs> like connecting to vendor EHRs or their platform, but also to third parties, for example, a biotechnology company or other big data um, vendors that would like to enter the healthcare space. And I think just to add on to that, uh, other platforms like Care Equality with Epic and Commonwealth we're, they're still early in the stages of embracing fire, um, but you know, looking at statements on both of their respective websites, they have discussed some intention of enabling fire. And so I think really, eventually we'd really like to see this platform applied not only to HIEs, but to these other third party platforms that allow data sharing through the various EHR vendors. So, so as you described that, uh, so what is the business model and ultimately who do you think pays for it? Because you kind of named everyone pays for it, which is a kind of scary business model <laughs> to run with. So, so where do you want to focus? So um, we, we thought about three applications for our business model. So one, we have the app itself. The uh, big app store vendors uh, offer, like the big EHR vendors offer app stores mm -hmm. where we can sell the app by a yearly subscription to the hospital systems, so they would pay for it. Then the second part is we develop, we're experts in developing the fire infrastructure, mm -hmm. so we can leverage this. And the third one is that we can license our app to third parties, like biotechnology companies, or we can develop uh, the app for them. Okay. What kind of relationships do you have at this point with those different, you know, E EHR yeah. vendors and be able to get in their platform, or, or is that still kind of a thought process? So our app goes live uh, in three weeks okay. in Indiana, yeah. connecting the health information exchange with Cerna. So Cerna, you got great. And then our next step is to go through the development process that we can actually bring it into the Cerna app store. Okay. Then we're going to connect it to an Epic hospital in our region, mm -hmm. and then go to the Epic app store. Great. And what are you doing as far as consistency of information, you know, in terms of the, uh, everything's in different formats and so forth, what are you doing as far as, far as consolidating when you're not using an HIE? So luckily with the, the fast healthcare interoperability resources allow us to standardize all the data to solve and solve that problem for us. So that for all of them, it, it looks similar. Mm -hmm. You need to have IMO codes though, right? <laughs> that would help. I guess the question that I have for you from the standpoint of um, having all these different systems and if you're competitive right now, and if you, you know, obviously fire is a standard that's coming out and how do you see that in the space? So we have, um, of course, the, the EHR vendor itself are our competitors who can develop a similar technology, but especially when we're looking at health information exchanges, there we don't see any competitors there at the moment. There is within the app store similar approaches to have like a, a personal record 
But um, our big advantage is the, the connection that, that, that we have. Like we have already our health information exchange and Indiana University Health is the largest health system in the state of Indiana. And we're connected on all levels with them. Um, this is my second question is, yeah. you focusing right now on the ER, have you thought about how certain same technology could be focused on patient health, patient ER? So we haven't uh, thought about this one yet. Our idea in the beginning was uh, that we would like to conquer like department by department, because in medicine people sort of innovate, they like to do what other people do. So, um, and then, yeah, go, go this, this route first. I think ultimately as well, I know Bill Hirsch actually did a uh, talk on this about uh, patients having their data and controlling their data. Ultimately, I could see this expanding as a sort of an interface from all the various <laughs> EHR specific sharing networks into sort of a unified framework that's built around fire and that patients and physicians can equally access. That was a nice segue into Bill's. So <laughs> thank you for <laughs> thank you for introducing me. You were talking about my blog actually, informaticsprofessor.blogspot.com. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I and you, if you read my blog, you know I share your enthusiasm for fire, as I think probably does everyone in this room. But fire is really not yet ready for prime time. So um, and even if you guys can process fire. Um, Unless there's things I don't know what's new with the Indiana HIE, um, the data coming to you will not necessarily be in fire resources and so forth. So how will you um, make calls out to servers? I know, for example, you know, Epic supports nine resources and in and, and, and read only. So um, uh, I, I guess the, the distilling it down is, is are there systems that use fire now that are ready to handle your app? So we've actually, so the Indiana Health Information Exchange, we've partnered with them. As Dr. Kaufman mentioned, we're going live with this in a couple weeks here. So we have built the necessary interfaces and, and the HIE was helpful to start with because they standardized all of their data for us and sort of enabled that, those fire resources for that data. Um, so they did a lot of the legwork in terms of standardizing everything that was coming in and turning on fire access and really allowing us to, to accelerate this project. I don't know that it would be possible at the moment to do that across other HIEs, um, but I, I think we could get there. I am Christina Garrels. I'm a physician from uh, Fargo, North Dakota. I think this could be a really useful uh, tool. I was curious, are you gonna provide a summary if there is other data um, to make that decision to jump back into the other systems more than just the five that you provided? Yes. So. Um, our, our idea is that uh, next to the five data elements that you see, you will have a search field underneath so that you can basically look for, ev for whatever you need huh? so that we're not taking that away from you. Thank you for make, not making me answer, ask that question as well. Um, my name is Ross Martin. I'm from the CRISP Health Information Exchange, Maryland, D.C., West Virginia. Um, and just to valid, do some validation here, um, we are – you know, we are we have a portal. Everybody can look at all this stuff, but it's it's increasingly large and lar larger and larger chunks of information that are very hard to navigate. So we're trying to do this internally within our own portal, but also we're making fire uh, resources available from our data. Uh, we don't want people even knowing what CRISP is necessarily. We're, we 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 don't have an interest in being that thing. We want the stuff to be in their workflow, and we know that that's a critical thing. We also know that not everybody has the resources of an Epic or a Cerner or a Meditech to, to, to build these things with a whole team, and so I see this kind of fitting into the and everybody else kind of venture where, where they need somebody to do this for them. So um, my question is, are, uh, so that's the validation part. The question is, are you planning on building tools for the people to design, so, so the clinicians can design their what they want, what the five things they want first for the different profiles? Or is it more, you tell us you're gonna keep building these kind of views, these, um, these water fountains out of the larger data sets? I think yes. Um, I think we could <laughs> expand out to other chief complaint uh, curated um, document lists and then expand to a little bit more of a customizable fashion. To answer quickly. Thank you. Much more to say, but thank Big you. Round of applause. Tweet them up for us, please. Thanks. Thank you, Fire Hydrant. So I don't know if you guys noticed, they went a little long. So that was, incidentally, that's Ross Martin.
Okay, so please go talk to Ross afterward uh, since uh, he's, uh, he's a great guy to know in this space. And this is exactly what we expect to happen and does happen at these events all the time. These amazing people, you guys, uh, will come and you'll engage with these ideas and say, hey, I never thought about it like that. You get to see what it's really about, much more than a static page. You get to see people stand and deliver in front of you and, and how they perform. So, so really, take a moment. Uh, if you're interested in working with these companies or talking to them, um, you know, uh, fill it out in the back. You'll have a little bit more time later uh, to pick who you want to tweet for uh, as your favorites. Um, so uh, that said, judges, are you ready? Okay, great. Um, uh, so, uh, we have J.G. Stahl from Zignifica, uh, is making clinical research applicable at the point of care. Twitter handle is Zignifica. Okay. So, you're all loaded up and timer ready? Timer's ready? Good luck, J.G. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, excited to be here. Um, so, I'm uh, J.G. Stahl, co-founder of Zignifica, and we're on a mission to deliver trusted, with a focus on trusted clinical research at the point of care to physicians and, and care teams, and we do it on a, a global level. Um, why clinical research? Well, we believe it matters, and we believe it matters to deliver care. Um, unfortunately, it turns out that <coughs> that research, that 85% um, of, of that research basically is wasted, and it doesn't provide useful, useful information. This is not me saying it. This comes out of a study by uh, Stanford. Um, and it's really hard for you as physicians or as patients to understand like wh what is the 15% and what is in the 85%. Now on top of that, um, the speed of that research is coming out is very overwhelming. Like you see some, some um, um, over here, the, the stats is that every 25 seconds a new piece of research comes available. And another study was done that came out that for an average primary care physician, they need around 29 hours a day to just keep up with the research. And that's only based on publications um, in journals that are relevant for, uh, for primary care. So um, like it's, it's really hard and it's very overwhelming. I, and I came um, to this from a caregiver perspective. Uh, my business partner, who's a practicing MD, came from it from a physician. And we both were very frustrated because we want to find an information and it's really, it's really hard. So we've came up with Significa, which is a point of care aid uh, that basically helps providers to, to find relevant research, relevant for their patient or for the treatment that they're, they're working on, um, but also to very easily understand the clinical significance, not the statistical, but the clinical significance of it. Now, in return, it's like what we're trying to do with this is um, take away the time that physicians and care teams have to spend on research um, and take that and spend time on patients, but at the same time, uh, really more focus on the evidence part so to provide better, better care at the, same, uh, at the same time. Now, how do we do that? So what is our solution to this? Um, so it does a couple of things. It's a, it's a cloud-based uh, artificial intelligence focused solution. Um, it basically processes clinical research papers. Um, we take those and we use uh, natural language processing. Mm -hmm. um, we're working with IBM Watson on, on this. And we take, from each paper, we take around 50 to 60 data, data markers, and we basically process, process through algorithms um, that, we, that we've developed for specific research, uh, research areas. And with that, we come up with a uh, ratings for the, the method that is used in that paper and the results that are seen in that, in that paper. And we come up with a very simple classification system from A to F that everybody can understand in terms of their clinical significance. So, um, and again, the, the algorithms are based on what is being taught in med schools. There are a lot of books how to interpret, um, basically, papers. Um, we've applied that, put it in the steroids, and basically automated to do it. Now, the next thing that we do to make it relevant at the point of care, um, like we use NLP to take the, the, um, the, the, like, things like inclusion, exclusion, we take that out, uh, which is typically very, very hidden in those papers. We take that out. The other thing that we do when we analyze a paper, then we basically add ICD-10 code so we can integrate um, this, this functionality, this system with, uh, with EMRs. And then we deliver it um, two ways through um, like chatbot functionality is what we're focusing on right now, but also we see through web services to make that available. Now how we're different. Um, we like to differentiate ourselves in, um, around two areas, like okay, our ability to identify trustworthy evidence and our ability in order to, um, is, it, is it relevant, yes or no? Um, I won't spend too much time other than like Probably most of you are familiar with UpToDate or Dynamet, who's also over here. Um, 
And so that's what we're competing with, but they're focused on statistical significance. We're very focused on the clinical side of the house. Um, so we're, we're pre-revenue. Um, uh, at this point in time, um, we have a prototype uh, developed, um, and that's in the, uh, it's in the app stores, and we're having the algorithms for, um, for four of the research areas. And we're very excited about the future, applying much more uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in, into this. We won't spend too much time on this. Like there, there are numbers supporting in terms of like our, the market opportunity and our go-to-market. Um, I think what's critical to say is like we're uh, right now two persons coming from different angles. Um, my business partner is a practicing MD in Denmark. Um, a lot of experience with peer review. Um, is a TEDMED scholar on the area of research. Uh, and I have a lot of experience uh, on the technology side, um, solving business problems using technology and a heavy uh, focus on machine learning and artificial intelligence. Okay. Um, I guess uh, one question that I have is if, you know, using IMO Watts, I mean, using Watson mm -hmm. for your um, services, in, in your business model, are you going to scale it? You know, how much are you going to give to IBM? I mean, how, how, how does it become affordable? And how are you going to handle those sites who are already licensing the content and they may want to use your service to even parse those content? Are you thinking about that as well? Yeah, so um, in, in terms of our cost, so definitely what you see is like from our, uh, I have a next funding slide, but um, so we're asking for 850,000. A big portion of that is indeed like memberships, right? Because we, our source is the membership and getting the, um, like the access to, to papers. The other hand is absolutely the infrastructure side. Uh, we're part of the Global Entrepreneur Program of IBM that gives us access to some free resources there. Um, but definitely as part of our um, subscription-based model, um, part of that is to cover those those type of costs. It's, it's gonna be a significant por portion of the cost. Yeah. Have you calculated the margin associated with that? Um, no, it's like we've, um, we've, we've looked at what, it's, uh, what it is. Like, the, um, like the, what we're using right now from IBM is the NLP portion. Um, we're, not using, we're not leveraging any of the other things for it. So, um, so it's very limited. Um, we know like we've already been approached by different um, organizations that want to, they're working on an, uh, a, a medical focus NLP that they really want, uh, want us to use. Um, so there are still things. But yeah, we have not, um, we, we've done some very rough calculations for us to see where we are and that we can make enough um, margin on this. I mean, um, the revenue is definitely, um, because it's subscription based and it's, it's driven by volume. Um, like their their margins are going to be there, so we see the, the the break even was in year two, based on the numbers that we that, that we got. Have you looked at any of the other uh, content plays, <coughs> specifically in oncology, like like NF one? Um, I've not looked at uh, at those. Uh, you should. Okay. Uh, who pays for this? Uh, so right, the physicians is what we're. So initially, we're um, we're now focusing on the primary care, um, because they need to have um, a lot of information. Uh, about a lot of lot of things, so that's what we focus on, and so subscription based. Like we're um, we're having two types of services. One is fifteen dollars a month, and the other is twenty five. So we've run our numbers with with an average of uh, of these things. And you know, our salary as as primary care docs is going down. I, exactly, and that's like so. <laughs> but and that's why we indicated with this is like we're um, uh, like one of the advantages we see with this is that it, it should hopefully return into spending more time with the patient and less on, on doing research. So along that journey, how are you going to validate that with the physician? Because obviously you're talking about becoming a revenue mm -hmm. business next year, yep. but again, people aren't just going to say, oh, let's tack on another. No, it's one of the reasons that yeah, the pilots are looking for pilot sites okay. uh, right now. One of the things in terms of like, okay, what's, is, does that really pay off in terms of like two things? Like one, does it save time? Right. Second thing is like, okay, to, do we deliver better care? And still, uh, that has to be made very, very pragmatic and very in, in very specific KPIs in terms of like, what, uh, what does it really mean? Um, so we see probably like two ways, like having some folks use the old way and our way, almost like a round trial. Right, so not pre and post. Exactly. Yeah. That's so what we're how many pilot sites do you have confirmed? So, so we're just basically coming out of the woodworks right now. Yeah. Um, so we're um, we're just basically coming out with, with this. We've not been very actively. Okay, so if um, we were talking again in 90 days, what would be a successful number of pilots you need? Um, we want um, like one, at least one in the U.S. Okay. Um, and one in Europe. Okay. That's what we're focused on right now. We're... Um, early conversations with, with One Health System, but that's really early. Um, so, but again, we're, we're just we're just basically coming out with this with this service. So. Okay, great, thanks. Bill Hirsch, OHSU. Um, do you, um, have you done any uh, testing, prototyping? I mean, there's a lot of academics at mm -hmm. this meeting that 
do research that tries to solve the problem you're trying to build a company around with variable success. And there is actually criticism of IBM Watson that there's more marketing than actual demonstrated success. So do you have any successful, um, you know, do you have any data that shows that you can deliver data better than someone typing a few words into UpToDate or Dynamed or, or Google? Yeah, so um, we, have, we do have a prototype out in the app stores, um, but it has like 100, 100 papers right now, and it was more to prove the, uh, to prove and to get feedback on the concept as well as the usability of it. So that's what we look, uh, we look into. Um, now I think that's the, that's, that's the main thing. We don't have any, um, uh, any numbers right now to prove it. This is really what we're, we're going after. We did do feasibility studies with IBM Watson to say, because there are very specific things that we <coughs> need to, data that we need to pull out out of a paper, and typically when you have multiple arms, and mm -hmm. data is all over the place in those papers. So we've been successful in that, uh, in the feasibility study to, uh, to, pull, to pull that out. We don't have to say, okay, how do we compare to something like an up-to-date, right? Up-to-date is very st statistically focused, whereas we're focusing much more on the clinical side and looking at some different things than, well, we, we, we always say we like to have the research speak for itself. I, not I'm not people. sure I would agree with that. I, I mean, a lot of physicians like up-to-date because it provides very concise, um, high-level mm -hmm. information. Oh, I'm, so I'm not, I'm not <laughs> diminishing the usefulness of mm -hmm. up-to-date. I think the only thing is like we're, what we're doing, we're not by, we're trying, like we have an algorithm, like, and it's, it's specifically applied for different research areas. But that's what it is, and that's, there's the information that we're looking for. So there is no bias. I mean, there's, um, I think I've talked to a lot of people, even at this conference, um, that feel that like when you get people to start looking and analyzing, there is a bias. Like with, that's what we exactly want to do with, with, with AI, is to basically get that bias out. The other thing, um, in 2020, like the, the latest stat I heard, that um, the, the time it takes to double the amount of medical information is 73 days. That's to double. There is no way we can solve this issue by just having people look at research. There's no way. We have to find a different way. Is our way the best way? I don't know. But um, right, this is just, we're just crawling with this service. I'm more excited about like real-time meta-analysis that we can start doing. But for that, we need first need to do what we're doing right now, uh, get that good data set. So now we have a, a set that we can do machine learning and taking it to the real-world real uh, avenue. So. Quick question. Real quick. Um, this is about uh, differentiating between the things that we know about now and the things that we're inventing for the future. And, yeah. and when you have terminologies that kind of take a while to build anyway, the medical knowledge or the medical research is often cutting edge. How, do you, how are you dealing with terms and concepts that are just emerging because they're being researched for the first time, really? And, oh. and how, do you, mm -hmm. how do you align those with things that are digestible at the clinical level? Yeah. No, uh, very good question. Um, so this is, uh, this is absolutely a moving, moving target. So um, if you take a look at the algorithms that we've defined, like they're different for research areas. So when you get new research areas or development, you have to update it. Now part of that is that's the powerful of machine learning that you can train uh, the system in order to leverage the new data. Um, so, so that's one, one way of looking into it, uh, into it as well. But yeah, there's um, like part of, the, of what we're doing is like we're the other thing that we're looking for is advisors, like advisors for the company, but also advisors to help with their algorithms, to challenge them, but to improve them over time, as you say, as new research comes available or focus. I hope the tour is working to help you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, big round of applause for JG. Outstanding, great work, JG. Uh, really great questions too. Good, uh, good, great stuff. Thanks, uh, Will, for uh, for getting up there and Ross. Uh, great questions. I will say, though, that you should probably keep your questions as short as you can, just so that, uh, because they only have seven minutes, and we're trying to keep everybody to that same standard. Okay, so we're here at the, the last but not least, uh, Mark Rippon, uh, he's got a solution, uh, I can't even pronounce, I always mess up this, Altergy, Alert G, Alert G, Alert, whatever, okay, <laughs> <laughs> Alert G-Y. Uh, anyway, so uh, so he came from Florida today, right? Yeah. Oh, um, so, yeah, so great, uh, great, great. Uh, job in the, your crowdfunding campaign, and we're looking forward to uh, what you have to say and, and seeing what you got. So, uh, is everybody ready? Uh, judges ready? Check, you sending your data, okay. Yeah. And uh, you guys are ready? Okay, good. J timer ready? Okay, come on up. Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to speak to you guys today. 
Um, I really want to thank uh, Alex and, and uh, all the guys at uh, IMO, Frank, Dennis, Barbara, Trinman. This is great. Thank you very much. Before I start, I'd like to explain to you why I'm here today. And um, it started about a year and a half ago. I woke up one Sunday morning, and my wife likes to sleep in on Sundays, and she wasn't in bed, so I was concerned. I called out her name, and there was no answer. So I walk over to the living room, and there she is sitting on a couch, staring into space. I go, good morning, Sue, and she doesn't recognize me. So I go to the refrigerator because I know she's having a low blood sugar attack, and I get some orange juice, and I make her drink it. And then five minutes later, she goes, where am I? Where am I? I said, Sue, you're OK. You're at home. You just had a low blood sugar attack. Everything's fine. Now, I watched my father die from diabetes one limb at a time. That didn't bother me as much as seeing what happened to my wife because I was, I'm responsible for her. So I thought, I'm going to do something about this. I've been doing research as a director of engineering for Stanford Research Institute. And marine, I was a director for the Space and Marine Technology Group, and I was working on sensors underwater and communications with RF advanced materials. And I said, I'm going to take this on like it's a DARPA project. And that's what I did. I was amazed when I started doing the research. My god, there's over 20 million people in this country that have diabetes. And there's nothing out there that solves the problem. We're using stuff that's like 20 years old. So I did my research, and I found a way to do what we haven't been able to do yet. Basically, use a smartphone and a wristband that has a detector technology that I developed for the government for, for classified applications to, to, to measure the blood sugar in real time. Like I say, the, the market is incredible. In the world, is over 400 million other people that are diabetic, and the numbers are growing. Yeah, there's a lot of competition. If anybody could figure out how to do this, it's going to be the best thing that's ever happened. Nobody out there is doing what we're going to be capable of doing. I put together a team of people I've worked with for you know decades on super type difficult problems. <coughs> and um, Craig Nelson is my manufacturing guru, and he has the capability of, of doing things from one part to making thousands and millions of parts. So he's going to handle that side of it. My sister actually belongs to this organization, AIMI, and she is a PhD from Duke with a uh, degree in biomedical engineering. She has an MD from University of Florida. She did her residency and got her MPH at John Hopkins at the same time. She's board certified in both data, health data informatics as well as in preventative medicine. So she said to me, my god, you realize that one third of this country is pre-diabetic. And I go, oh my god, I don't believe that. Yeah, if we could change the behavior of people so they don't become diabetic, <laughs> that's a big thing, Mark. I'm, all, I'm on this stuff. Let's do it. We have a world-class advisory board. You'll probably notice some of the people on that list are, are well-respected in your community. And they're helping us to make sure we do it right. I have a, a great prototype facility with all types of equipment, and then we can do what we have to do to make things in-house really quickly. The whole thing is fully scalable. We're going to use a three-pronged sales approach, go internet, direct to consumer. We'll work with healthcare organizations and providers, and also channel partners. The cost of the device is $30 to manufacture, distribute, and we're going to charge $100 in a subscription model, and basically that will generate a lot of business real fast. We're talking about a billion dollars in recurring revenue with only 10% of the market in the United States, and that's in the first year that we, we go to market. As you can see, we've accomplished all the green arrows are things we've already gotten done. The blue one is the, one, the white one is the one that we're working on right now. I'm trying to raise another $250,000 so that we can get this thing done and go to Series A funding and let's rock and roll and do it.
question, what, what really holds you, what holds you back? I mean, what's, is there, because we talked about you when looking at the pilots, is are you trying to use this money to do the first pilot and? So if you look over to the slide, what I've been able to accomplish so far is to take a refrigerated size spectrometer, reduce it to a cigarette pack size system that I can strap onto my arm. The next series of money we're going to be using to, to further shrink it so it becomes a wristband. So what I need is money to do that next, to finish up our data analysis <coughs> to do what we have to do. Do you, do you, go ahead. Gonna, do you need FDA approval to develop this device and is that easy to do? Well, I mean, uh, the precedence has been set. If you look at the slide over there, this is our strategy. It's a 510K process. There was a watch that was put out about 15 years ago. It was called a Pandra. And so we're going to use that precedence. We're going to have a much better device. And um, that's the approach we're taking. We also hired a consulting company to help us with the FDA process. And we're working with very prestigious preclinical clinical trial people that are going to do the do those things for us. I can't talk about it because it's confidential, but I'll be willing to speak uh, under NDA for that information. Yeah, this is maybe more of an editorial comment. I've, I've been in businesses before that, uh, you know, active ingredients and medication control in the FDA, don't underestimate, even with your partners, how complicated and your timeline you have in here probably is a little aggressive. Yes, uh, but because of the level of inobtrusiveness <coughs> of this technology mm -hmm. and because of the desperate needs that people have, um, we believe that we should be able to get to go it, and we're also pivoting right now. We're probably going to come out with a pre-medical device. We're talking to the biggest smartphone, smart watch company in the world. They want to license it. They have a platform called Simband that we're going to put something out there. And just like the Nighthawk guys did, they hacked the Dexcon system. So they're saying is we're not going to wait. Okay, so uh, David, can you uh, pause the time for a sec? So uh, 11.45, we're gonna do the data collection for the tweets. So you've got like three minutes to, and this is our fifth presenter. So please tweet out with the AMIA 2017 hashtag, uh, which team you like best, or just some comment on them. We're just gonna count the tweets. Uh, that's just, you guys are one judge in this judging competition. Uh, so, uh, uh, so you can start his timer again and uh, continue. improvement, but you also have that communication, which is how to make it more active than just simply checking at that moment. Right. So on the, you didn't talk a lot about the communication side, how you're going to make all those interfaces work with, you know, text, smartphone, so on and so forth. So give us a little color there. Okay, so uh, we're using Bluetooth. It's going to be encrypted uh, to communicate to the smartphone. The smartphone is going to use Watson um, and also iThread approach so that we basically will have uh, in the cloud the analytics, the super analytics and uh, tracking and everything and on the data side of things. What we're actually doing is generating pictures of individuals biochemistry, a spectrum of who you are as an individual and everybody is going to have a different spectrum. And the thing that's really mind boggling about this is that it could be more, th more than just diabetes that we can start picking up over time. We can start seeing traces of things that are going to go into a disease mode where it becomes obvious the person's got a problem, right? But we can maybe detect these things before they become a problem and really change the way preventative medicine works today. And that's, that's why my sister, Dr. Helgis, she's crazy about this. So <laughs> are any of the uh, major, you said you're, you're dealing with one of the major players, but, you know, is Apple with their new, uh, the, the new watch, the kind of things that they're doing in terms of uh, uh, body sensing, the wearables and so forth. Is anybody, are these technologies that are being used by any of these folks? Uh, are you consolidating at all? What's, what's going on? Yeah, so uh, Apple, for instance, uh, is using dielectric spectroscopy in, in their approach, but, you know, the thing is they don't know what we know in terms of they're using amplitude only, scalar. Uh, we use what they call vector-based analytics. So vector-based analytics allows us to do a four-dimensional analysis. This is technology that's developed in the government to look for things underwater that are impossible to see. The data processing there using anti-Markovian processes, uh, we can actually pull the needle out of the haystack. And that's where 
they're going down the wrong way because you have to have vector-based data. It can't be magnitude-only scalar data. It's not going to work. I think it's a great idea, but I want to know where your IP is. What's your competitive advantage? I Our mean, IP? I, you can say 4D, fine, but how, ca how come somebody else can't do the same thing? Well, first of all, some of the same stuff we did is based on classified research that most people are not privy to. So that's one side of it uh, for the analytics. We have a rules engine that's copyrighted and basically it's going to be like trade secret. The same thing with the dielectric materials. We discovered them by accident when I was the engineer at SRI, director of engineering. We discovered technologies to the shrink antennas that would be the size of a telephone pole to this size. And, and that gives us the best broadband ability to collect the data that we want. So the entrance, very entrances are going to be difficult for other competitors because of those pieces that we have there and then also because of prior art that we have. And we, we're doing patents, definitely we've got several patents already that are out there. And we, you know, what trade secret is one of the big things that we want to do because, you know, a lot of competition, you know, how, and I know about Apple and everything, you know why? Because they did the patent searches on what they're doing. They bought seven companies. But, you know, you have seven different experts. They're all arguing with each other because they all want to push their own technique. It takes a combination of things to do it right. So, What do you think your biggest challenge is going to be with your go-to-market strategy or the biggest risk? I, I don't think it's going to be because I've done Internet startups before. Um, I think the Internet approach for direct to consumer is probably the cheapest way to go at first. Viral marketing, I think it's going to be big. But then teaming like with these manufacturers and licensing, they know how to sell. And so we want to get the word out and, and build it, you know, like a guerrilla marketing type uh, process. But it's definitely going to be a challenge. Be before I stop, I'd like to ask how many of you people um, are diabetic or know someone that's diabetic? So here's your chance to do something about it. Since time. Sorry. Now, do you have a working prototype? And if so, the data collected, how accurate is it compared to like a finger blood stick sugar? I can talk to you later on okay. that. So, thank you. Great job. I'm sorry. I mean no disrespect, but you know, it's a contest and we just kind of have to do it like that. Um, so now, um, please take a moment to, uh, to, uh, to fill out the forms. We're gathering all the data. Um, and if, you're, if you want to uh, engage with the companies, obviously you can see them here. If, uh, if you want to uh, uh, give us more information about what your interest level in them and have us uh, send the information to them, you can either take a picture of it and email it to the phone number there. You could fax it. Um, yes, faxing. We still do that. It's healthcare, right? Um, <laughs> You got to make that joke, right? Anyway, um, and so yeah, take a moment as well. The judges and and uh, Biza does does the math uh, and all that. So just talk amongst yourselves. We're going to do the, uh, the check and the prize presentation in five minutes. So.
saw your picture. I'm like, oh, she must be sitting right there. <laughs> Uh, so we also really want to know what you guys think about this contest itself. Um, so if you go to medstarter.com, or sorry, twitter.com front slash medstarter, there's a poll at the top of the page asking if you guys thought it was awesome, or if you think we got to work on it, or if it, meh, that's one of the options. Meh is always an option. Anyway. We got the finalists, okay. It gives me an honor to announce the winners. Um, it was definitely an could, exciting Could everybody hour. sit down? You was in the back. Could you either come in or leave? So it's, it's, it's really, to be honest with you, this was an, an amazing experience. I think just preparing for this and having opportunity to work with MedStarters, I think, this whole experience of getting the crowd involved, 
and getting the interactions going back and forth with the candidate. We did this in a very rapid fashion, so hopefully next year we'll have a lot more time and get a lot more academic centers involved participating in uh, entrepreneurialness here. So I think from 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 standpoint of starting from a third place, um, I, I, I believe you change story care helps, which is number three. Come on in. Right. The left? Oh, here, all right. So this is a, come on up here. Interesting enough, I mean, just, 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 just so you know, I'm originally from Iran, and my mother's Jewish, so, so I, got, I, I got it all, so. The best of both worlds, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So this is a uh, uh, voucher for $5,000. Thank you. Um, second place goes to Allergy. Your, your story was definitely, especially about your wife. I mean, my heart went with you. My wife was a Cuban Jew. Oh, wow. I'm a German that was born in Libya. Oh, wow. Wow, beautiful. Is the check for 7500 Thank you so much. You know, cr clearly win this transformation. And, 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 and truly, not only all the judges, but all the audience voted for Fire Hydrant. Congratulations. <laughs> this is check for 12500 Oh. Good thing they're tall, right? Okay, uh, uh, judges, what do you think? Thank, Thank you very much. Let's get everybody oh, here. Oh, 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 so, we want to thank all of you for coming, for participating in this challenge. Again, thank you very much for everybody's participation. Thank you. Thanks so much. If you want to get involved with the companies and the projects, there's, uh, there's still, uh, the projects are still live on the AMIA, on the Minnesota AMIA pages. So uh, there, the link was wrong in the program, so it's If anyone filled out the handouts, bring them up here. Perfect. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks so much. I just had, I had to reply. I had to reply. No, I think it's great. I, I just, I just don't know that the technology. I know, I know. I was a business decision. All in jest. Hey folks, so if you if you like this session, please go to the uh, twitter.com front slash medstarter. We have pinned to the top of our profile a survey, and we want to know if you think that this is awesome, or like I was saying, meh, or just, uh, you know, we could improve. We'd also love to hear what you think, so feel free to uh, email us at feedback at medstarter.com. Thank you, Susan Hull, Colin Hung, Michael Rothman, Will Hirsch and everybody for making this such a great event. I know, I know. This is nice. Did Henry approve? Henry approved is okay.